Welcome to Full Prefrontal, the show that exposes the mysteries of executive functions. This show is a collection of conversations about the role of the prefrontal cortex, which impacts your focus, planning, problem solving, emotional balance, and independence. These conversations will introduce mental tools that will empower you to shift your mindset for a successful life. And now, here's your host, Sucheta Kamath. All right, welcome back to Full Prefrontal, where we are exposing the mysteries of executive function. As always, I'm here with our host, Sucheta Kamath. Good morning, my friend. Looking forward to very much so to this coming conversation. Yes, Todd, so great to be with you. And I'm going to get started with a wonderful story about a boy. And this boy was born and raised in Cincinnati to a restauranteur, I guess, and a concert pianist mother and an electric engineer father who encouraged him to join Boy Scouts and get all the merit badges he needed to. And because he was interested in photography, he worked on earning a photography merit badge by creating a tiny film that he called The Last Gunfight, which was about nine minutes long. And that worked really well. He continued with his boyhood. And turns out that he eventually kind of created a 40-minute long film, which won a prize. And by 17, he had written and directed a few first independent kind of science fiction movies. And by the time he was ready at 18, he entered California State University in Long Beach. But only to drop out. And he said to his parents, parents, I'm going to quit college and pursue a career in entertainment. So my question to our audience and you, Todd, is if uh, Leah and Arnold, who are the boy's parents, uh, who heard their kid declare that he's going to quit college, what should they think and what should they do? Right? I mean, uh, I can imagine if this was a 21st century parent duo, they'll panic. (laughs) Yes, they'd have a coronary. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. So all parents who want their children to grow up and be independent and find happiness, their conventional wisdom says, let me push my child to do well in school, work hard on stuff and take part in various activities to find myself. Because to a parent, the path to success has a formula, which is education plus passion plus excellent performance equals a career, which means a life of a bliss. So well-meaning parents want their children to find the career and then through that connect to their passion. So I think they get a little bit backwards in my mind, at least. So if Leah and Arnold had freaked out when they heard their son, Stephen, drop out of college and prohibited him from committing such a disastrous step, would we have the movies called Jaws and (laughs) (laughs) E.T.? So that turned out to be Steven Spielberg, you know. So on today's podcast, we have a very special guest who is here to burst the myth like Harvard or McDonald's or Yale or jail. (laughs) So let's find out what is the sweet spot when kids get to embark on a meaningful journey as they become self-sufficient and self-directed. So it's such an honor and privilege to welcome Dr. William Sticksrude. He's a clinical neuropsychologist and a founder of the Sticksrude Group, a lifespan neuropsychology practice. He is also a member of the adjunct faculty of the Children's National Medical Center, and he holds a faculty appointment as assistant clinical professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the George Washington School of Medicine. Additionally, Bill is a frequent lecturer, and he has authored scientific articles on transcendental meditation and book chapters on meditation and the integration of the arts and education. And as I understand, he's getting ready tomorrow to leave for India for another immersive experience. Can't wait to hear about that as well, if he gets a minute to talk about that. But finally, he has amazing publications, or he has participated in amazing publications. He has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Times of London, Scientific America, uh, times.org. He has been a guest on NPR, and he has written for the Wall Street Journal. And I myself have heard him speak on many occasions, but last time was at the Learning in the Brain conference. So with great joy, I would love to welcome you, Bill, to this podcast. I feel welcome. Fantastic. So this is a question I ask of all my guests. This podcast is about executive function, which entails goal-driven, self-guided behaviors to attain self-determined success in an adaptive way and without losing your mind, without losing your focus, and without losing your emotional centeredness. So in short, executive function is what helps people maintain their life's equilibrium. So do you mind 
if you start with your own executive function skills and were you attuned with your strengths and weaknesses at a young age? And were you inventive when it came to formulating strategies for learning and finding your passion? So (laughs) in relation to this story, (laughs) I finished college and I was a pretty good college student, but I had trouble keeping up with stuff. I probably took 12 maybe incompletes in college. But I did well enough. I got myself into this very top PhD program in English literature at at University of California, Berkeley. And I went for 20 straight weeks without turning in a single assignment. And when I work with underachievers, I say 20 weeks, nothing. Top that. I set the underachieving bar high. But I think it was largely because two or three people told me when I was at Berkeley that I was the most nervous person they've ever met. And I was drinking caffeine to, to stay up and I smoking pot just to try to sleep. And I couldn't concentrate for more than probably eight or nine minutes at a time before I had to distract myself. I didn't finish anything. I was too anxious and insecure to turn any work in. So I eventually flunked out. And certainly it took me about two months to realize that it was the best possible thing that could have happened to me. No way should I have been an English professor. But also one of the people at Berkeley who I was roommate with said, if there's anybody on this planet that needs to learn to meditate, it's you. So I learned to to (laughs) meditate. And within probably three weeks, my foot stopped tapping. I mean, my foot used to tap unrelentingly. Within a month or so, I I could sit and and focus for an hour or two hours at a time as opposed to eight or nine minutes at a time. And my experience regarding executive function, my personal experience was so much about how stress undermines the ability to focus and think clearly and to plan and to organize and put things in perspective and to get stuff done. Because I tell you, for 20 weeks, I was a master at not getting stuff done. And I don't really think that I have an attention disorder. I tend to lose stuff, but I'm pretty organized. I'm pretty planful. But under stress, you know, that the the, Mm. the great stress scientist, Amy Arnson says, stress mimics ADHD. And and I was just a laboratory example of that in my early 20s. Wow. Thank you for being so candid about this. And it's so interesting. I hear this again and again from all the experts that I have interviewed that their self-discovery came to its fullest actualization in college. And we are expecting our young minds to achieve that at a very young age. And then we are withholding some support in hopes that they show independence. And then some places we are completely taking away their agency. So that's where we are now to talk about your expertise. So let's start with this. Do you believe that the way kids are being raised and taught, are they being denied a sense of agency or control over their own lives? So I wrote a book. It came out in February 2018 with my friend Ned Johnson called The Self-Driven Child. And the thesis of the book, really, it's it's a book for parents and educators, but the the basic idea of the book is that a sense of control, having a sense of control over your own lives is arguably the best thing we can give kids, other than the message that we love them unconditionally, the sense that that this is their life and we respect that and we support that so that they have this healthy sense of control or autonomy or agency is arguably the best thing we can give them because it's associated with everything you could want for your kid, this healthy sense of control. And there's a very interesting line of research out of by um, Jean Twenge at University of San Diego. Yeah, I love her work, yes. Yeah, yeah. She's demonstrated that young people's sense of control has become much more externalized, much more, I, I'm kind of a pawn of the universe, there's not much I can do about it over the last probably 50 years. And we know that kids' sense of control of their own lives diminishes every year they're in school. And because the stress scientists say, that a low sense of control, where you feel helpless, you feel just overwhelmed, or there's nothing I can do about it, is probably the most stressful thing you experience. And one of the insights that Ned and I had was that when we're looking at this unprecedented level of anxiety and depression and loneliness in young people, and these are all stress-related problems, and if a sense of control, a low sense of control is the most stressful thing you experience, this must be a really big deal. So I've been thinking for the last two or three years a lot about this idea of a sense of control or agency or autonomy, because it's so important for mental health. It's the key to self-motivation. And it turns out it's good for everything. If you have a sense of control over your own life, if you've got a parent in, in assisted living, they live longer. If they simply have, if you ask them, do you want to have dinner at 4 or 4.30? You know, they, they, they live longer. <laughs> yes. You or know? water the plants if they were given that, the chance to water the plants. That's plant. right. From just a scientific, but from a brain point of view, from mental health point of view, a motivation point of view, an achievement point of view, 
it's huge, which is why we wrote this book and spending the last year and a half going around the country talking about it. So can we dive slightly deeper about what is this psychological phenomenon of sense of agency? Is it a belief system? Is it a character, you know, your constitutional characteristic? What is it? So I think that, that certainly there's probably a genetic basis to, to if you come out, so say people are more inclined to receive that, that I have agency, I can make things happen, and, and other people are more passive. So, so some of your listeners probably know the work of Carol Dweck, you know, kids who have a, kind of just got it born, they seem to have a growth mindset where yes. I, I get better with my own efforts, a fixed mindset, there's not much I can do about it. And yet I think that child rearing plays a huge role as does simply how we care for the prefrontal cortex. One of the guys who helped put this idea, make this idea so popular, so so powerful, this idea of a sense of control, is Steve Meyer, who actually, some of your listeners know about the, the concept of learned helplessness. And he, he was one of the two scientists who kind of came up with that idea of learned helplessness yes. in the 1970s. But his basic research on sense of control, the paradigm, is there's two rats, rat A and rat B, and they're in a cage, their tail's outside the cage, and there's a little wheel in the cage. And the rats get shocked. Their tail gets shocked. And it's not painful. It's just annoying. And rat A finds if he turns the wheel, the shock stops. And what happens when he turns the wheel is his prefrontal cortex activates like crazy. And that activation dampens down the stress response. So the rat A just goes into coping mode. He's not that stressed because he's coping. The prefrontal cortex is driving the rest of his brain, and he's coping. And rat B turns the wheel and nothing happens. With this kind of experience over several times, rat A basically becomes almost impossible to stress. So you can put him in a cage with big rats and then he just goes into coping mode. He doesn't freak out. He doesn't try to get away. He doesn't cry. He just, <laughs> he just goes into coping mode and rat B becomes just incredibly easily distressed. And what Steve Meyer says, that that experience of being able to control stressful situations, be able to handle something stressful and deal with it successfully, with your prefrontal cortex activating, damping down your stress response, that inoculates you from the harmful effects of stress, which is partly why this is such a big deal. So, such the, a big the, deal. Ned and I think about this sense of control in, in two dimensions. One is that what you're saying, that subjective experience of agency or autonomy, this is my life. And frankly, I love the idea for kids to thinking, this is really a kid's life. And so it's that accepted experience that this is my life. I'm going to get out of it what I put into it. And I'm not helpless. I'm not hopeless. I'm not passive. I'm not resigned. I'm not chronically overwhelmed. I'm not obsessively driven. I have a healthy sense of control and ability to direct my own life. So that's one dimension. The other dimension is the brain functioning that supports that. And when we're in our right minds, when our kids are in our right minds, when we have that healthy sense of control, we're engaged, we're motivated, we're working on stuff, and we aren't overly stressed. Our prefrontal cortex basically regulates the rest of the brain. And once we start to get stressed, it's beautiful. Yeah. It, it, once we start to get stressed, the amygdala, this primitive part of the brain that senses and reacts to threat, basically starts your fight or flight response. And, and stress hormones flood the prefrontal cortex with dopamine and norepinephrine. And then you can't think. So the amygdala runs the rest of your brain. So the concern for young people is we want young people to be in their right minds. We want them to have this brain state where their prefrontal cortex is regulating the rest of their brain and they aren't overly stressed, something stressful happens, they cope with it as opposed to getting really anxious or avoiding or, or getting angry. And we think that it's by supporting the sense of control that we help children develop this subjective sense of agency. And also, we culture a brain that's used to being in its right mind. As you said in the introduction, executive functions help you to create a life that's challenging and meaningful, but not overwhelming. So are we living in a high stakes world or is it our perceptions that have gone haywire? Why is there a great sense of fear and anxiety on everyone's mind about the future? Not the future of the country as such or future of the globe, you know? I mean, of course, granted, we have greater access to the information about what's happening in the rest of the world. But even for a child who is bright, whose future is manageable, why is every parent and every school feeling that? What's it's the a, difference it, in 21st century, so to speak? <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great question. Yeah, and most of us, probably most people listening to this podcast, are living in the safest time and place in human history. And the, the experience that the world is such more Nobody dangerous. Nobody will believe that sentence you just said. <laughs> they don't right? believe it. Well, it, it, I mean, but Stephen Pinker wrote about this whole evolution of uh, what violence has gone down, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Oh, yes. And there's a guy out in Oregon. 
I think his name is Barry Glasser. We mentioned him in our book, who makes this conclusion that most of us are living in the safest time and safest place in human history. And yet, parents are probably more anxious than they've ever been. Young people are more anxious than they've ever been. There's a lot of hypotheses, including income inequality, including the fact that we sleep so much less than we used to, including the effects of technology, making life more stressful. And I'll just mention that when I was in graduate school the first time and I flunked out, well, I, there, I, I did read part of this book called The Causes of Increased Nervousness in Americans. And it was written by a physician in 1881. Oh my goodness. A 1881. The hypothesized causes of what he perceived to be this increased nervousness were things like the railroad and the telegraph and the pocket watch, things that make life go faster and made us more attentive to small increments of time. And you wow. think about how that's morphed over the last you know, 150 years and that life is so fast paced. And with the 24 second news cycle report and that the, most of the money is in negative things happening. And we reported it, some kid gets abducted. We hear about it like we never used to before. And even though child abductions are very rare and the, and the most common circumstances is a divorced parent will take the death of the kid. The abductions by strangers haven't increased in the last many years, but our perception that the world is physically more dangerous and psychologically more dangerous has certainly changed a lot. Yeah, and I, I read even uh, Jonathan Haidt's book about the coddling of the American mind yeah. and this sense of emotional safety issue, which is, again, feeling unsafe, which is a very new, brand new phenomenon, at least in our culture, that didn't exist. Like, you know, I remember, I mean, growing up in India, of course, if you fussed about or complained, it was always considered your fault, <laughs> which has <laughs> got, gone too bad, to one extreme. But, but yeah, so do you think that also is playing a role about feeling that there's somehow psychological harm waiting if a, a sense of challenge comes your way or sense of threat because of lack of skills comes your way, you know? Yes, yes. And, and I think that many parents have the idea, and understandably, nobody wants to see our kids suffer. But going back to that rat A and rat B, one of the implications that we talk about in our book is that we want kids as much as possible to solve their own problems. Because of that experience, if a kid comes home and is really upset about something and they got dumped by their girlfriend or they flunked a test or they're the only girl in the friend group that didn't get invited to a party, that what we ask parents to ask themselves is whose problem is this? Whose problem? Because it's, and it's so hard as parents to remember that actually these are kid problems and that our job is to provide support if necessary, or some suggestions, but not to try to solve the problems for them. Because the way kids become resilient and the way kids develop high stress tolerance is in part through managing, the, it's through dealing with their own problems and solving them. So they have that experience of the prefrontal cortex activating, figuring out what to do and coping, damping down the stress response. And that trains the brain to just go into coping mode. And certainly many of the kids that I work with who are going off to elite colleges have not had very much experience. There's been so much kind of interference and in, in trying to try to protect them from challenge that they haven't had to deal with it themselves. And I think they do become more fragile. And they do become, they develop lower stress tolerance. And what we want for kids, what Ned and I say in our book, is we want kids to have high stress tolerance. We don't want them to be chronically stressed all the time, but we want them to be able to have a nervous system that can function well in stressful mm. situations. Yes. And, you know, I think this dovetails with one of the concepts you have written about, which is the idea of the acronym NUTS, <laughs> which is coined by, I guess, Sunia Lupin. And yeah. can you tell us a little bit about, and you beautifully connect that to this idea, as you mentioned, when we are telling kids to tolerate stress, but the stress has many shades. And tell us a little bit about that. So Sonia Lupien is one of the great stress scientists in the world, and she's in Montreal. And she basically says, you can summarize what makes life stressful with the acronym NUTS. It's novelty, unpredictability, perceived threat, and a low sense of control. The S is the sense of control. Mm. And so it's new situations where you aren't un unpredictable, anything that could be potentially threatening to physically or to your ego, being free fear of being embarrassed, or this low sense of control is going to activate your stress response, your fight or flight response. And again, a lot of the stress scientists say it's really that sense of control 
that low sense of control is the most stressful because you can be in a new situation or even an unpredictable situation or even a potentially threatening one. But if you have the sense, I can handle this, you know, I, I, I can call my dad or I, I could, that, that it's not as stressful. It's that not knowing what to do about it, feeling helpless, feeling I, I don't know what to do. And, you know, and I was struck by, there is a cluster of suicides in Palo Alto three or four years ago. And there's an article written in the Atlantic about it when we were writing the book. And a couple of the experts who were asked about these kids, these kids are just overwhelmed. He said, how do we understand these kids? And one of the experts said, they feel existentially impotent. Wow. And another one, another one said, you know, I used to do therapy. Madeline Levine, who yes. you, you know, Madeline Levine, yes. The yes. Price of Privilege. Yeah, the yeah. Price of Privilege. Oh, my God. Right. I love that book, too. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, but, she, you know, she says, I've done therapy with these kids for 25 years. And 15 years ago, they used to fight back. Now they don't fight back. They just kind of resign that their life is just life of constant trying to achieve it at the highest level possible so they can get into elite college. And it sucks, but there's nothing they can do about it. And so every place we look to try to understand, you know, how do we help kids achieve at a high level without being unduly stressed and miserable? It came back to increasing this sense of control. That's so sad. Makes me really, really sad that they feel so helpless or they feel that the stress or the life's calamities are larger than their capacity to fight it. Well, I, you know I, I mean? know. And, and, you know, part of it is they just have a worldview, kind of a delusional world. They, many kids, yes. at least, <laughs> they, they grow up with kind of delusional worldview about what's important and about what adult life is really like and what it takes to find your place in adult life. And, Tell um, us a little the, bit more about that. That's like really fascinating, which is, I think, that's why I love that your perspective is to challenge this perception of the world. You need to do something called resetting it, right? <laughs> Well, that's my sense. It just seems to me that I just wish we could tell kids the truth. And so many kids, at least in the area where I live and many of the, the areas that I'm speaking at around the country, have the idea. Well, I'll just first mention that I gave a lecture a few years ago, just a little talk to uh, an 11th grade AP English class at a pretty academic public school in Bethesda, Maryland. And when I finished, and the kids were really nice. They're polite and they ask questions. And, and at the end, the teacher came up and whispered and she said, these kids all think it's either Yale or McDonald's. <laughs> you know, and, and if you actually look at the research, the research that's compared kids who get into Ivy League schools but then choose not to go, they become as successful as kids who go to Ivy League school. But all the research suggests it really doesn't make very much difference, at least for most kids. And there's some advantages, clearly, to go to elite schools, but more for graduate school, probably, than undergraduate. But that so many kids grew up the idea that the most important outcome of their adolescence is where they go to college. I and from my point nice. of view, and it's just absolutely crazy when you have to look at it. And I've, just, I've asked for years. I had an article in Time magazine last year. Why don't we just tell them the truth? Why don't we just tell them the truth that it doesn't seem to make very much difference? And so if you want to go to Princeton or Yale or Stanford, go for it. But then so much of mental health is transferring, I have to, to I want to. This is something I, I, don't, I don't really have to do, but I want to do this. We're running on our prefrontal cortex, our motivational drive, rather than on fear. There's so much focus now on getting into the 1% or the top 5%. Why don't we just tell kids? That after you make about 75000 bucks, more or less, depending where you live, more money doesn't make you happier. I just think we have this delusional idea that top students are, gonna, are, are inevitably more successful than kids who aren't that good a student. And we know that valedictorians, by the time they're 25 or 26, they aren't more successful than anybody else. If we just took the attitude that I want my kid to work hard to develop himself so he has something useful to offer this world, I think that's the healthiest kind of way to think about how we want to help our kids and support their development and not saddle them with this crazy idea that somehow the most important thing is that they always do well in school and achieve the highest level so they get into elite college. And if you look at the mental health problems in elite colleges, they're off the charts. They can't, yes. hire, they can't hire mental health people fast enough. And the people in college say it's what the kids had to do to themselves, basically, to get into these schools. So You know, I, I think what you just said, I'm seeing one more variation of this behavior, which is so either that you go to, as you mentioned, you know, McDonald's or your no, I mean, you, you go to, of course, an Ivy or McDonald's. I mean, there's nothing in between. But the second thing I'm seeing is this weird belief that you can be Kim Kardashian or you can be mm. Mark Zuckerberg. You can quit school 
without any skills. So the skills are not emphasized, you know, developing this ability to learn intentionally, take agency of your effort, kind of understand, take the time to understand yourself is almost like a second rated behavior or set of skills. So that's also a cultural emphasis that may not be coming from necessarily from their parents or teachers, but they see that like the PewDiePie is my favorite example. This is a dude who plays video games and his earning last year was reported to be 3 million, I think, or something like that, who plays video games, records it, and the kids watch him play the video games. They're not even playing the games. So kids are really caught in this dilemma that if I quit school, I can be successful because some people have done it, but then they don't have the discipline or they don't have ideas or they don't have the skill set that support the (laughs) the success. Right. Right. (laughs) You know, I personally think, what I tell kids is that you become successful by working really hard at something that comes easily to you, that you find something you're, you're kind of naturally good at, and then you work really hard to get good at it. There are a few kids in my career where I've actually encouraged them to drop out of school. I encourage them to think about it in part because I want underachieving kids, and certainly many of the kids that I see with, with executive functioning problems are underachieving. And by the time they're in high school, they often have been told so many times how important it is that they do better because the grades are going to follow them the rest of their life and that kind of thing, that they're just so discouraged that the first thing I tell them is you could flunk all your classes. And if you decide that was a bad idea, you want to get an education, you can go to your local community college for two semesters and get 30 credits. And then you can apply to most of the colleges in this country without showing your high school transcript. And actually what happens when I say that is it motivates kids to work hard. Hmm. And because they figure, what's what's the point of trying? I've never really had a kid drop out But I've had many kids where they're just so discouraged about school that I want them to have an accurate model of reality. And the accurate model of reality is that you didn't have to be in school after 16. And for many kids, just knowing that, knowing that they don't have to, motivates them to stay in school. There's a story in the book about a kid who I saw, I'm a neuropsychologist, I test kids for a living. All the kids I see, almost all of them have executive functioning problems. And I saw this kid who was like getting a 2.4 grade point average in high school. He said, I do no work. And I was just talking to him. He wasn't my client. Well, he he was, long story. But in any case, I didn't test him, (laughs) but I spent an hour talking with him. And he was passionate about his local rescue squad. He'd studied the the test. He passed the test. And he loved being part of this rescue squad, but he spent no energy on school. So I do no schoolwork at all. And and I talked to him about dropping out of school. And he looked at the options. And it turned out, as soon as he looked at it, he had to stay in school to stay in the rescue squad. And then his mother called me three months later and said, God, thank you so much for telling him that he could drop out. Because once he looked into it, he realized that that I need to stay in school. And he had the idea that there's a fire science program in the University of Maryland. So if I don't have better grades, I can go to community college and then I can transfer into the fire science program at Maryland. And this mother called me three months later and and said, he's got a three six. I love your point about kids who have the idea that I can just there's an easy way. For me to to be successful, like these people who who open presents or play video games or something. And I tell kids that the really key is finding something you're good at and something you love to do, and then just work really hard to get better and better and better at it. Yeah. I mean, I think in my practice, I've seen so many kids exactly the way you see with executive dysfunction, underachievement, and just not in the zone of their passion. And I also find, and I often encourage students to consider this, that it is not until your sophomore year, end of sophomore year, you have a choice in terms of the courses you take. So if you do pursue this academic path, the choices of courses you take that creates a career doesn't come your way until you fulfill the prerequisites. And a lot of kids that I work with struggle with the prerequisites because they hate it or they're not good at it or they haven't cultivated the habits that allow them to actually work hard at things that are boring, annoying, or difficult. Yeah, (laughs) right. (laughs) You know, so for them, I do recommend that you should take a sabbatical, you know, academic sabbatical, like just a gap year, or do some service, like having connection with your community. And one of the young men that I work with, he was extremely fond of rescue animals. And then Mm. he started working at a local pet store, then eventually started working in a nonprofit. And the way he blossomed by taking care of somebody else's needs immediately then, uh, not immediately, but that was his way of knowing his own needs and give that kind of attention and care to his needs where he was not performing well. So that empathic perspective he developed by doing something, but nowhere in his academic time that he could have 
offered that kind of attention to animals and rescued them because he was just so busy doing homework, which is meaningless <laughs> to him, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, and you no, know, there's a story in the book about a girl who was in eighth grade and she had learning disabilities. She's actually a school for kids with learning disabilities. And her mother came to consult with me as she did periodically about the fact that the kid didn't have any passions and the mother was kind of worried about it. And six months later, she came and, and talked to me about something else. Remember we talked about the passions? What, where's that? I said, oh God, I forgot to tell you that after we talked, somehow that this girl found out about the Washington Animal Rescue League. And she got incredibly involved in it. And, and, and within a couple of months, she knew all the rescue animals in D.C. and Maryland and Virginia. And just as you were saying, Suchita, that, that that morphed into passion for early childhood education. What I tell kids once they're 15 or 16, I, say, I want you to really pay attention to what you love to do, what you just truly enjoy doing. And also, I want you to know what you can do better than most people, or at least as well or better than most people, because that's really that conjunction of what you love to do and what you do well that really can, can guide us. And there are people like me. I didn't know I was going to be a psychologist until I was 30. I failed it. I failed as, as an English literature graduate student. Then I got a job. as a, I went into teaching, but I was a terrible teacher because I had no behavior management skills. And I needed to work with kids more one-on-one. -on -one. That's, that's gone pretty well. But I see a lot of kids who aren't working hard in school. And I asked them, I said, what, what do you work the hardest at? And if they say sports or art or music or rock climbing or coding, almost anything other than video games, they say that. I say, I don't worry about you because I know you're sculpting a brain. A guy named uh, Reed Larson, who studies adolescent development, was writing in the late 90s about his research where he's trying to figure out how do children become self-motivated adolescents and adults. And he concluded it's not through dutifully doing your homework. He concluded it's through the passionate pursuit of pastimes. And even the late 90s, he was saying video games probably don't count. We could talk about that if you want. But the idea was this. When a little kid is completely engaged in building with Legos or an imaginative play, or the, so somebody, a kid is really working hard at music or sports or art or dance or drama or coding or rock climbing, whatever it is, working hard to get better and better and better. They're in that flow state. A lot, they spend a lot of time in that flow state where your complete engagement that combines high energy, high attention, high focus, high determination, and low stress. And from my point of view, that's where we want to be. That's where we want to be as adults most of the time. We want to be focused, engaged in the present. We want to be motivated, but we don't want to be highly stressed. And so we talk in the book about one of the ways we culture motivation because it's by supporting that passionate involvement in pastimes where they're getting better and better and better in something through that complete absorption that's so good for the brain. I love it. You know, I have had uh, Bill Damien come and talk about the path to purpose, the idea how to discover. And uh, one of the things I hope the listeners got out of that is this idea that parents are so desperately trying to shove a passion into the child's yeah, 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 throat. Yeah, yeah. And that by definition is not passion. It should be self-discovered. Not somebody else cannot tell you, tell children that you should be passionate about. And I see this so much in my practice. I see highly successful, and of course, it's a private practice in the most affluent part of Atlanta. And mm -hmm, what happens mm -hmm. is the parents say, look at me, how successful I am. <laughs> I what? used to be like him <laughs> or her. And then secondly is, you know, it doesn't matter. Why do you care that teacher is asking you to do math? Just do it. And they're expecting that becoming good at something will come from doing it more. And they are missing the point. The life of the child is so structured that I feel that this whole beautiful thing that you just said, that cultivating a culture where the child's discovery process is given a little bit more time, like to find out what I love. What if I need to try at least 10 things or 100 things, maybe, you know? Well, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and certainly it's becoming clear that most children, when they're adults, will have multiple careers. And I think that many people, certainly myself included, I mean, I had no clue when I was in high school that I'd be a psychologist. I had no, no idea at all. I, I'm sure I knew there was such a thing. And I think that, that life for many people is long and interesting and has turns. And I think that we are kind of naturally good at some things. I think about wanting kids to pay attention. What, what are you kind of naturally good at? And hopefully that, that parallels with, with what they like to do. So, so talk to us uh, about this idea of inventing yourself. So in this context, as I love this invitation for every person to reinvent themselves over time 
and shape their interest as they grow, mature. And as you mentioned, even in career, you know, one of the devastating things about growing up in India was that at 17, 18, when you graduated from 12th grade, first of all, in 10th grade, you had to take a track (laughs) and they were called arts, math and science or commerce. (laughs) And Mm -hmm. commerce was looked down upon because it was considered a field for accountants. Very, very boring. So a lot of stereotyping, as you can hear in my voice. Right, right. And then secondly, at by 12th grade, you had to decide a career and you, you were supposed to die in that career. So when I came to U.S. and I did my second master's in my class, I was barely 25. And there was a person in my class who was 45 and he was a lawyer. And it blew my mind. I said, mm. what does your mom say? <laughs> he said, what? <laughs> I said, You're giving up your lawyer career? (laughs) So I'm so grateful for this American culture, at least promoting that you have an opportunity to reinvent yourself. So what do you think of that concept? Well, you know, I think that the Indian idea in many traditional cultures that you do what your parent did. I mean, in some ways, there's some wisdom to that in the sense that I think we inherit tendencies. I'll rarely see somebody who's really good in something where one of the parents isn't also pretty good at. I mean, I think that, that we probably inherit kind of brains that are wired in a certain way. But I do think that ultimately what I love about America is the idea that you're really free to create a life that you want. And there's a lot of experiences that I had early in my career that really supported this idea of autonomy and and encouraging from early age, giving kids the message that this is your life and I want you to figure out, I want you to help you in, in any way I can. But really you get to kind of get to figure it out. And one of the experiences was how often I'd sit down, I used to do a lot of psychotherapy early in my career. I'd sit down with a 35 or 40-year-old, the first session, and I'd say, how can I help? And they'd say, well, I feel like I've spent the first 35 years of my life trying to live up to other people's expectations. Now I'm trying to figure out what's important to me. And I'm inside thinking, I I think, let's start, let's get an earlier start on this. Let's, let's, (laughs) Let's get an earlier start on helping kids figure out who they want to be. And one of the wisest things anybody ever said to me about raising kids was some, I don't remember who it was, but they, they said, what I love about teenagers is when they come home from school, you get to see who they're deciding to be. And I love that perspective rather wow. than as, as a parent or an educator, I'm supposed to make my kid turn out to be a certain way. Yeah. And certainly if you, have, if you have that idea that that's your responsibility, it's a pretty thankless job because you really can't make kids do stuff and you can't make them want what they don't want. You know, you can't, you can't put a passion in them, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> so I love this perspective that we can invent ourselves and we can reinvent ourselves. Do you have a separate messaging for an educator versus a parent or is the message the same? And what would that sound like if you're so, advising I mean, the, them? Our message I'll just, you can summarize it this way. Certainly one of the big ideas in our book is that we we suggest that parents and educators, as kids get older, think about themselves more as consultants to the kids than as the kid's boss or manager or taskmaster or homework police, where our job is to help kids figure out how to make their life work, how to create a life that they want. And so in this consultant role, we offer help, not try to force it down a kid's throat. We offer advice rather than trying to jam it down a kid. And as I said earlier, we want kids to solve their own problems. And Mm -hmm. we also place a big emphasis on kids making their own decisions. And I felt my whole career that the best message you can give a teenager besides, I'm crazy about you, is I have confidence in your ability to make decisions about your own life and learn from your mistakes. And I want you to have a ton of experience doing that before I send you to college. And so much, I think, of, of what we see where, where the very high percentage of kids not making it in college the first year. I had an article in, in the New York Times, Ned and I did in November, because at that time we knew eight kids by November 1st who had started college and were already home. They'd already given up. And I think those yeah. kids, by definition, did not have sufficient experience with the running their own life. So we want to support kids in making decisions and helping them make a good informed decisions with our advice and our support and the support of other people is necessary. But we think that, that for educators and for parents, this idea of, of thinking yourself, think about yourself more as a consultant to the kid, as opposed to somebody who, who always who knows better than the kid necessarily, or always knows what's right for a kid, or as somebody whose job it is to make a kid turn out a certain way. Yeah, I love this message that you're giving everyone this this unconditional acceptance along with trust that mistakes are inherent to living a full, robust life. And I see, I detect potential 
in, that's such an assuring message to come from people that, that you love and respect. And uh, that kind of mentorship, if you're surrounded by such kind of mentors, you will feel quite confident to make great mistakes. <laughs> well, you know, you know, it is. And, and my experience is that when we tell kids that I'm not going to try to force you, oh, this is going to be your call. And we, you, you, you kind of, you, you talk stuff through that, they, that kids make good decisions for themselves. And they often make decisions that, that the ones we want them to make. I was lecturing, lecturing about our book maybe a year ago. And somebody came up to me afterwards and said, my family is Jewish and my son is refusing to do his bar mitzvah. And it's a really big deal. I've been fighting about it for the last year. And so she said, I, I can guess what you'd t- advise me, but can I can come in and just have a session with you? So she came in and she explained that you know, he just doesn't believe in God. He, just feel, does, he doesn't want to do it. And so I said, here's what I suggest saying to him. I'd suggest telling him that obviously you couldn't make him do it. You couldn't make him learn his portion from the Torah. You couldn't make him drag him up on the stage and, and move his lips to, to, to get him to read it. Obviously, so force is off the table. You couldn't make him do it. And also, tell him just how much you respect the integrity. He's only 12 years old, and he's thinking with great integrity about, I, I don't want to be a hypocrite. I really respect that so much. And also, I want you to know that it's really important to me. It's really important to your dad. It's really important to your siblings and your grandparents and your aunts and uncles and your friends. We want to welcome you to the Jewish community. And I hope you'll find a way to do it. And a couple of days later, after resisting for a year, the kid said, OK, I'll do it. You know, and then he negotiated with them. About, I want to do it this way or that way. But my experience is that when we, 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 if we assume that kids, they, they want their life to work. Mm. They got a brain in their head. And if we treat them respectfully and we try to minimize the extent to which we use force. And this, this applies for educators as, as well as, as parents. It goes well. In my experience, now there, there are times where the kids can't make a decision for themselves. They're drug involved, or they're extremely depressed, and we have to kind of we have to use force. We have to get get them in treatment, or put them in a program, or do something. But short of that, I think our, our motto, Ned's and my motto, is is that let, let encourage kids to make their own decisions and go with the kids' decision unless they're crazy. Meaning, unless almost anybody would say that's a terrible idea, because that is expressing that kind of confidence in kids. Just, it just matures them in a beautiful way. And also, the way you, that wisdom, they say that wisdom comes from making bad decisions. You know, experience, you know, the kind of experience, I, I learned from that. I don't want to do it that way. And we, we don't want to protect kids from bad experiences because that's, that's how we learn. Well, Bill, this has been a, such a fantastic discussion. And I can see you are the kind of person I can talk to for hours. This was very, very informative and most importantly to me, assuring that there is a way in spite of all the pressures that every person, even I don't know how people are finding to listen to this podcast, but the fact that they did, they have somehow found the motivation to listen to this important topic. But I think they are going to get a great sense of assurance from you that when we take these steps, it's going to work. So I truly thank you for that. And thank you for coming on the podcast and sharing your wisdom with us. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. All right. That's all the time we have for today. If you know of someone who might benefit from listening to today's episode, we would be grateful if you would forward it directly to them. So on behalf of our host, Sucheta Kamath, today's guest, Dr. William Stixrude, and all of us at Cerebral Matters, thanks for listening today. And we look forward to seeing you again right here next week on Full Prefrontal. Thank you for listening to Full Prefrontal, exposing the mysteries of executive functions. To contact our host, Sucheta Kamath, and learn more about her work on improving executive functions, visit her website at CerebralMatters.com. That's CerebralMatters.com. Tune in next week for the next informative episode of Full Prefrontal.